I'm Robert Roach, and uh, I draw and write some stuff and publish some stuff. And I was fortunate to have some wonderful friends who were willing to join with me in trying to talk to you, because I'm sure that a lot of you have some wonderful ideas uh, ready to show to the rest of the world. And some of us up here have done that, some with more success than others, uh, coming at it from teleplays, from uh, televised animation. Folks up here have been on Cartoon Network and such. Uh, novelists who are published, not I'm writing something. Uh, and I hope that this is informative for you. I know that it's going to be fun for us, and we really do, after, introdu after introducing who we are and what we do, uh, it's going to be free-flowing. Give us your input, hit us with your questions, hopefully some of the stuff, some of the experiences that we've encountered will make it easier for you to bring your thoughts to fruition because I don't have uh, crabs in the bucket mentality. Uh, and in the African American community, we often talk about man's crabs in the bucket. As soon as one of us starts to climb out, the others pull them back down. And I just have a dream that maybe all the crabs in the bucket could knock the damn thing over and we can all run free. So that's the attitude from which we approach this. Um, the other panelists will. Uh, there's one guy who's late. This is not Justin Peniston. He'll be sitting right here. But this is Brandon Easton. And he can tell you about himself and what he does. Thank you. Um, I'm Brandon Easton. Um, I come from the world of Indian comics, but right now I'm one of the writers of the new Thundercat show from Warner Brothers Animation. I am also writing for Transformers Rescue Bots, which is on the Hub or Hasbro Network, whatever you want to call it. Um, earlier this year, I had a graphic novel release called Shadow Love, which was kind of a cross between like Vampire Hunter D and Thunder, or Transformers and Underworlds, guys in mech suits fighting vampires, but they're not like quite like that, so it's a whole different ball game. They real mean that. Yeah. Um, the trick though is I've dedicated a lot of my time and energy and money into mentoring independent writers, screenwriters, people like that. I have a podcast called Writing for Rookies, which is dedicated to science fiction and uh, comic book writers. It's one of the few, if not only, dedicated to aspiring comic book and science fiction writers. And I spend a lot of time on that. I try to interview as many people I know who work within the world of comics and Hollywood, so I can give everybody a more full-fledged view of how to break into the industry, because many times, you go to a lot of these panels, and I've been in this game since roughly 98, but I've been on the panel since 1990. And a lot of panels don't tell you anything. It's just a bunch of people telling in-jokes and anecdotes, and they don't give you any real advice as to things you can actually apply in the real world. And I've been on that side of the panel many more years than I've been on this side of the world, and I haven't forgotten a single thing about that. So I try to be a resource for people who are serious about putting their work out there, not people who are just making it up, and obviously if you come this far, I'm pretty sure you're serious. So, as he, as Robert said, it's all about questions, it's all about you guys as well. So whatever it is you have to say, really think about very specific questions that you could use, with the answers that you could actually use today, tomorrow, and the next couple of days, or weeks, or even years. So uh, just think about that, and I'll do it, I'm sure the rest of us will do whatever we can to answer those questions. Just a second, Melissa, go ahead and say what you did. Hi, uh, my name is Justin Peniston. Um, I'm an independent comic writer. Uh, I have written a couple of times for DC Comics. Uh, I write a couple of web comics, uh, Hunter Black and Planet Pantheon. Um, I've written for Zenscope, for IDW. I would do a little freelance animation writing. Um, I apologize for being tardy. My, uh, my wife actually wiped out on the way here. We just we came straight here from the emergency room. Okay. Because she's a huge trooper. She's so, okay? Yeah, she's okay. Because she's that would okay. be crazy if you were here. No, 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 yeah. I, 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 you guys may have Facebook messages from me saying, I'm going to get back. <laughs> um, and, but and we do not want to be the cause of yeah. another failed Hollywood. <laughs> 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 but, 
but no, 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 no. She, she was like, we are going to this panel. I was like, babe, I want you to be okay. We are going to this panel. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> anyway, I'm just dedication. Okay, or yeah. love or something. Who else is having We're going down one. Hi, my name is Melissa Jarvis, and um, as you can see, I'm the one female on the panel. <laughs> and she can represent. I can represent. I write kick ass heroin, so I need to kick butt, kick butt on the panel tonight with these guys. I am a publicist and have been in the industry for over 15 years and working with entertainment and nonprofit clients. Everyone from Playboy to um, the Los Angeles Mission to the Center Theater Group to JBS to Indie Film. Um, and I have somehow managed to find time also to uh, be a, a writer and I write paranormal, historical, time travel, and urban fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I am published. Uh, uh, my first book, Past Your Time, um, just came out about a year ago. And I also write in a genre which you may have heard about. Um, so if anyone has sensitive ears, um, if anyone's heard of the phenomena of Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> <laughs> so not too many people can find me. Um, so I'm here to talk about um, small press publishing and um, some of the trends in indie publishing for novels and also to answer any PR questions y'all might have. And yes, I'm from Texas, so you might hear the y'all in there a few times. Hi everybody, my name is Larry Welch. Um, I've worn quite a few hats in this industry in the years I've been in this industry. I've been here in this industry as a professional since 1987, so I've kind of been here for a minute. Um, I did start in the independent um, industry, uh, self-publishing um, with a group of friends, with one of them being the artist, and uh, the penciler of the book was J.H. Williams III was, and he and I uh, basically had our first published artwork together. And he went on to do Promethea and now Batwoman. So, and he's doing some really great work. Um, with me, I have, like I said, I've worn many hats. I was a senior artist at Malibu Comics during the, during the Ultraverse years uh, doing that. And then I went from there, I went to Image. I've done portfolio reviewing. I've, done, I've been uh, an editorial director for both uh, Marvel and DC. So I, I kind of have both sides of, of, of the spectrum as far as how you want to make it in the industry as a professional, and uh, also how to publish your own comic book and, and the steps that you need to go to do it. And, and uh, that's pretty much me. I'm now published, going to be going back to the independent industry and publishing my own creator, own character. Um, I have a, you know, a few people that's interested in publishing the book for me, but I'm waiting until I finish a project to see exactly where I want to go is, is doing as far as doing that. So that's it about me. Awesome. Um, I'm Dale Wilson. Um, originally uh, started as uh, a publisher and writer, self-publisher uh, under Black Productions. I've published five, six of my own books, um, and then I also have published a couple other books under that same banner. Um, sorry, I see friends in the audience, I have to acknowledge. Um, so yeah, so Black Productions is where I started. Um, I've done web comics. Uh, at my day job is online marketing, so uh, I really come at comics kind of more as um, kind of wanting to, to see how I can get it out to the world and get it seen. Um, so that's kind of a big piece for me. Um, and my newest fun thing is buyindicomics.com. And it's my way of uh, putting together friends, family, uh, etc. 
uh, people that, that I've met over the years in comics and uh, getting articles out about them, talking about them, talking about the indie comic books in the comic book industry, and um, yeah, trying to just really talk about indie comics as opposed to you know seeing a lot about the big two all the time. So, oh. Did I say? Yeah, I love you. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Um, I'm Jeff Thorne. I am uh, indie comics creator uh, with my partner Todd Harris, who may or may not be here. Uh, we are together, uh, John and I team. Uh, we did a book uh, last year and the year before with a entertainment called Prodigal, Egg of First Light. Uh, we have something coming up uh, from Dark Horse that I'm not apparently allowed to talk about until they announce it, so whatever. Um, I write for the TV series Leverage. Uh, I have written a bunch of episodes of Ben 10 in various incarnations. Um, and I broke in because of Robert Roach putting me together with my work wife, who is my partner, Todd. Um, I know how to write comics um, and somehow how to navigate. He, he also had a successful career as an actor, but nobody cares about that. That's not relevant. 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 <laughs> so not relevant, that's not fun. Um, so, um, I used to moderate these panels. Um, these guys undersell themselves a lot. And, uh, well, Brandon hasn't been here before. But, uh, um, and uh, there's a wealth of knowledge up here about um, just the, the nuts and bolts of just doing it yourself and not asking people for permission. Uh, this, I believe this crew is probably the Avengers of doing that. So uh, ask those wacky questions, the things that like matter to you. I think we're more like the defenders. The defenders? The defenders. They fought all the time. They yeah, the defenders. The well, yeah, we are more collegial than they were. Yeah, that's, that's, they're, but they did have a great time at the deli. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> anyway. Why didn't Schwarma ever since? So that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I gotta say, I'm much more concerned about Justin and his wife. Are you guys okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you okay? I, I'm pretty sure she's okay. She's back there with the split. Oh my she, um, Dear God. Yes, so I wait, saw her. Yeah, a round of applause. She, she's a real trooper. She, uh, this is her first Comic Con, too. Wow. And um, I'm fairly certain she doesn't ever want to come back here. But um, she, uh, the doctors say there's nothing broken, or at least we're not sure that nothing seems to be broken, uh, just a bad sprain. Um, and. We, we got out just in time to hop a cab and show up here, and she was insistent that we come. She's incredibly supportive, which is probably one of the number one things that any creator, whether independent or otherwise, needs is someone in their corner. Um, and I'm lucky to have one, so. Thank you. Open the floor to questions. Floor? Yes. Microphone. Yes, we have a mic, we have a mic in the middle of the uh, aisle here, um, step up, step up. and shyness is not permitted. I don't play that. If you ask a question, now, I still have a respect. Res that. Respect is, is a given, uh, but be be yourself, have fun. We're going to be ourselves, so y'all might as well be yourself, too. Okay? Okay, so this thing you can tilt that up. Yeah, you can tilt that up and talk. Okay, so it was great, great to do media. How do you guys make money on the comics that you sell on not paper? So are any of you guys doing anything with uh, the, like Kickstarter to do comics or something like um, like Apple newsstand apps? Is there anything going on in that space? Uh, yeah. Yes. Dale or Justin? So yeah, I mean, Justin can talk about some web comic stuff. I can talk about some web comic stuff. I, mean, I guess I'll start then. Cool. Um, so yeah, like I said, I do online marketing as my day job, right? So I'm out there kind of trying to get other people's websites seen. Um, and, and so I have a little bit of a leg up, and that's been beneficial to me in terms of like how do I build the site, how do I make it kind of search engine friendly, kind of is what they, you know, refer, how they refer to it. But there's also a ton of sites out there that where you can um, essentially kind of work into somebody else's network, right? So they're a network of of indie comics, and you can kind of get your scene. Now, in terms of the making money aspect, um, I, I 
you know, that's a tough one. I've been doing it for a couple of years, and now I can't answer that question really. There's there's the AdSense idea, right? So if you can get a ton of people coming to your site, Google AdSense will hopefully, you know, people click on the banners, the ad banners that show up. I've been doing it for a few years now. I think I've made a hundred bucks doing that. Um, so I, I don't necessarily recommend that as a way to pay the bills. Um, it might pay your hosting if you're really, really lucky, right? Um, yeah, so part of it is, is just making sure you get seen, making sure that your, your, your site gets out there. Um, that's actually a good portion of why I'm doing buyindiecomics.com is I feel like there aren't enough avenues for indie comics to get seen, right? So how do we, how do we as indies get, how do we compete with the big two, right? How do we compete with the big two, let alone everybody else out there that's maybe mid-majors, et cetera? And so that's part of why I'm doing this. Um, is to hopefully get you guys seen, and, and as creators, and as well as kind of websites as well. So in terms of making money though, I, I, I see anything you do on the web as advertising for yourself. Um, I think Justin probably can speak to this too, is like, when I post comics on my website, it's not necessarily because I, I want to make money off of that, it's because I want to get my story out there, first of all, right? I want, to, I want people to read my story, but also I want people to kind of see that as a resume for me, right? So I, hopefully based on that, I'm able to maybe later kind of get print versions of that that I can hand off to other publishers, et cetera, and, and build some interest in, in, my, in my brand. Does that answer your question? No. All right, Justin, I think. Um, you don't go into web comics looking to make an immediate profit, that's for sure. Um, I launched, my, my collaborator and I launched our first web comic, Hunter Black, almost exactly a year ago. Um, and we went into it. Our only expectation in the first year was to be consistent about making our deadlines. Um, I think we are probably right now maybe $2,000 in the red on our, on our web comic. Um, because, you know, we paid to have the site designed. Um, we actually pay someone to do our logo design and, and uh, lettering. Um, and we printed up a whole bunch of posters. Now, we've gone to a couple of conventions. We went to WonderCon and we went to, uh, to, to uh, Chicago, C2E2. And we managed to sell, we made back about $100 so far. Um, but we don't quite have enough material up yet to print a book. Um, which is where, at least in our minds, not only is there actually going to be a market, but there's an air of legitimacy at that point. Um, but we knew this going in. We knew that we were not going to make comics to make money immediately. Um, and certainly, you don't make independent comics, whether in print or on the web, because you're looking to get rich. You do it because you can't not do it. Write that down. Um, you do it because, as I tell people, whenever someone asks me about comics, um, I would rather fail at comics than succeed as a restaurant manager. Do you know what I mean? Yes. Um, and once I made that decision, that I was willing to do this until I, you know, th there were no other options, that made it easy to pursue. Um, and just like Dale said, this is very much for me a resume. Um, I mean, I was lucky to have a little success prior to, to starting the webcomics, but certainly I find myself as a creator, as a freelance creator, being taken much more seriously now. Um, I wasn't writing animation before I started doing webcomics, and I am now, you know, so. Um, but I think, I, I like to think that they will eventually make some money, you know, I hope. I mean, I, I don't not want to make money. I just don't know that they, I don't know when that's going to happen, you know. Can I? Can I answer this oh, from okay. a sort of a short story novel point of view? Sure. And um, you actually can make money with self-publishing short stories, novellas, which are basically 40,000 words or less, um, as well as self-publishing your own novels. Um, there is a site, um, some of y'all may have heard of, called Smashwords, uh, which really changed um, 
the industry. It allows you to upload your stories. Um, you set the price. Um, what a lot of authors do is they come in and either free to build their brand, as they were saying, um, or they come in at 99 cents. If you have a Kindle or a Nook or another e-reader, you'll probably see a lot of books at that price point. And there are quite a few success stories of independent authors who have been with traditional publishing companies who have decided to either publish what's known as their backlist, um, books that have been out of print for a few years if the rights have reverted back to the authors, or um, they've published their own story, um, uploaded it through Smashwords, it becomes available on Barnes & Noble, Amazon, the other bookseller sites, and they've been making six figures, and they're not having the um, having to pay agents, they're not having to pay publishers. So in this industry, uh, indie publishing, at least for writers, um, novellas, short stories, that kind of thing, um, has really changed the game. Um, on, I presume most of the people here are creators of some sort, either artists or writers or both. Um, on the art side, in the uh, comic book world, uh, there are the analogous to Smashwords would be uh, Comixology, which if you have an iPad, you can get their app for free and, exa and see exactly what that is. Basically, it's a uh, retail outlet for web comics. So you make the web comic and they distribute it and you guys split it. Uh, whatever is made. So if you don't make anything, they don't make anything, essentially. Um, Smashwords and uh, Amazon are not yet good enough for images to do what we would expect from a comic book. But the, the, the game is, in fact, in the process of changing, as I think everybody on the other end of this table knows, and everyone out there knows. Uh, there's a website called Web Comics Nation, if you want everything posted up just on the web as you traditionally would find it. There are new forms being created right now. Um, and uh, both Marvel and uh, almost every uh, every one of the other bigger companies experimenting with a new version of webcomic, uh, which they use various uh, PDF forms and some new proprietary software to try to duplicate or enhance the experience of reading a comic and make it happen on your tablet or your pad. So the truth is you're not gonna make a dime going in right away, but this is a marathon. It's not a sprint, you know? So you're not going to be, it's possible you'll get Hellboy money, but it's most likely you won't get Hellboy money until Mike, the time Mike Mignola got Hellboy money, which was about 20 years into Hellboy. Yeah. That the, everybody discovers Hellboy when they discover Hellboy. Hellboy started in 1982. Oh, right sensation. Yeah, yeah. Right. and it was a steady grower. It did really well, but it did really well for a comic book. And then all of a sudden the world discovered, hey, comic books are cool, and now it's a big motion picture, and, you know, animation and all of that. If you're going in with that in your head right away, it's going to trip you up because what you really should just do is make a really great story. Don't worry about the money yet. The, the story and the character, the, the story and the character has to be what's really burning at you, not the ooh, how is I going to make some money? Yeah, it's got to that that that's what's got to be burning for. You. Um, there's so many opportunities now. The internet really loves to play field for everybody. Yep. I mean, I'm a bartender and I managed to put up a pretty professional looking webcomic that I'm really proud of. Um, so, it, it, and if I can afford to do it, most people can afford to do it. Um, and that when it, that's when it becomes really important to really practice your craft. Because the increased opportunity means that there's a huge increase in people actually doing it. And if you want to get noticed, you know, there is no substitute for being good. Yeah. And there's no reason you can't be good. Everyone can be good. You know, they say every writer and every artist has 10,000 bad pages they have to get out. So the more you write, the faster you get good. You? Right here, please. I mean, you guys kind of answered a lot of what I had to ask, but basically, I'm a new creator, I have a new website, I'm about to develop. Um, I wonder if you could speak to kind of how I could market a web comic. It seems like the web comic market is a lot different than regular comics. Like when I look at any web comic website, the top comics to me on the spectrum 
aren't very visually impressive, but they're very popular. Like you go on Kickstarter, the top comic project is not artistically overwhelming. And I'm just curious if like they're not artistically in terms of visually overwhelming, but yeah, but they're well written. I mean that's so Todd, who I don't think he's here. Is Todd here? No, it's Harris. Alright, so he'll show up. He's, I'm gonna be angry at Todd because he's not here. But Todd has a fa what I what I consider a famous quote, right? Artists get readers; they bring readers in. Writers keep readers, right? I mean, that's that's what's important. So, yeah, they may not be the the, the, the most well articulated, uh, super dynamic, visually looking comic, but they're not going to be successful unless they're well written. Also, so just that, that just don't don't let that get lost. Both Miss Jarvis and Mr. East uh, are writers of things that I presume they both really like, right? Like Brandon's Brandon told me this idea for his comic book uh, some years ago for Shadow Law, and I was like, what the hell? You know, because when he told it to me in one sentence, I was like, that that sounds insane, man. But his execution of that comic was wicked cool. And I presume the same with these stories. You like this material, so you write this material. Yes? Yeah. So the answer to the question is, although those particular stories and comics are doing well, and you're like, why the hell is anyone liking this? <laughs> because you're not the audience. Yeah. That's what you have to assume. If I'm not getting it, I'm not the audience. But your audience will find you if you raise up to that level of excellence where they must look at you. Piggybacking off that, how do you target your audience? And how much of it is just build it and let it come as opposed to going out and finding it? And what are some of the avenues and platforms that you can use to reach so, Yeah, well, I was gonna say, um, one thing you have to do is be cognizant of who you like. Who do you like and who is influencing you? And then beyond that, um, who are you going to compete with? Um, when I can talk about uh, some, I can talk about my character, the Roach. Um, it's not about me. Not about me. Um, it, it's all about you, Robert. <laughs> it's all about you, Robert. He it's denies it. He denies it at every panel. It's all about Robert. Nobody who knows him and nobody who's read the book actually believes him. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I am a white man in Prohibition, Chicago. <laughs> uh, Maybe. But, uh, you know, uh, there were some people, I'm just going to talk about the reviews, and it, I think it will piggyback into what you're, yeah. some of the questions you've had. Uh, there were some people who took a cursory look at it and saying, ah, this is just a rip off of the shadow. Ah, uh, this is a guy trying to do another noir. Ah, uh, here's another detective thing. Ah, uh, whatever. But then I got people like, uh, Tony Isabella, like uh, CBG, um, like uh, East Coast Black Age of Comics Convention and the Glyph uh, Committee, to actually look at it. And at the time it came out, Tony Isabella said it's the smartest adventure comic on the on the scene. Um, Glyph gave a story in black and white about a white guy in a period piece who's an anti-hero. The first indie uh, rising star award for Glyph for, for, for an indie publisher. And the main people responding to it were the African American community. So the people who took a cursory view of it missed it. They're like, ah, here's a stereotype. The people actually read it and got into the characters and all that kind of stuff said, he's doing a good job. Screw the people who were looking at a cursory view. I can't control that. I can control, as these gentlemen and this young lady have said, raising my level of the game, making sure that my characterizing and that my storytelling and my artwork within it, because I did everything, y'all, I did everything. Um, it was at the level. And, and the haters are gonna hate, screw them. Uh, you handle your business, you look at what compares, you, you see what's out there, and you handle yourself accordingly. Melissa, um, can I ask, as a publicist, to put her publicist hat, um, how would a person like this gentleman here, like, test the waters and sort of see, what would you, what would you, what would you advise? Um, there are a couple of different ways to go about it. It depends 
really where you want to hit, where you want to find your target audience. Um, one of the things that indie publishing and small press publishing has done has really narrowed down and focused on those niche markets. There are publishers who strictly publish, like for instance, erotic or romance. There are publishers who strictly publish sci-fi. Um, so they're already finding their niche audience that way. Um, the other thing, you know, of course, is that we've all heard about is social media. Blogs, Twitter, Facebook, um, all of those can be used and combined to get the word out about what you're doing. And what you have to look at, though, is you have to look at outside the box. If you are writing a comic, for instance, that has a hero who has a dog, okay, um, not only would you focus on, um, you know, like indie comic blogs and things, but you would also focus on anybody who does a blog about pets, anybody who writes about pets, any, you know, pet fancy, um, with, you know, you can approach them to do a story. So if there is anything interesting about you personally that's different, you can also take that angle and turn it into a feature story. For instance, if the reason you're writing about dogs is because you have one or a dog rescued you from a fire, yeah. that's a personal <laughs> interest story. <Yeah. laughs> that is a personal interest story that makes it interesting and you get the word out about your comic. Or the other thing to do um, that's very popular that the media likes is trends. If you can hook on to a trend, and then say, hey, the latest trend going on are comics about dogs or comics that cross genres. And I'm writing this type of comic and a couple of other of my friends are writing this and hey, you should kind of look at this as a new trend that's going on. So there are different ways to think outside the box with publicity using social media, you know, and if you have like for instance a Facebook page and you know there's a dog fancier Facebook page, make sure you're on it. Yeah. Use every I work with publicists actually in entertainment in general, but I'm not sure how much different that is in publishing. Zero that zero. 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 So is it about like for instance in my line of work, I work with a lot of entertainers and such, a publicist does a great deal of justice for you. And and paying that service can put you in a lot of positions that you couldn't get in. So saying all that to say, is it worth it for any creator to make that investment early? Or should they, you know, is it really necessary to do the groundwork and exactly. build yeah, exactly. to exactly. give them something to work with? But that depends on the quality of the product, ultimately. I mean, you can have the best band, you can have the worst band in the country with the best publicist, you'll get into a couple of venues because you have the best publicist with the best connections or the best agent or whatever. But if you suck, you're not gonna get asked back. So then, then all of that money you spend and all that work so it goes back to the original of, you really have to be frosty about this stuff. You have to look at what's on the shelves if it's comics. Look at what's on the shelves, look at your team or yourself, if you're, if you're the person who's doing the art or the writing or whatever. Can I beat half these people? Is what I'm doing capable of beating half right. these people? Because these comics are what, $3.99 now or something ridiculous like that? Am I gonna not buy this month's Spider-Man? To get unknown dude that I've never heard of with awesome with awesome art, the only way is to kick Spider-Man's ass, basically. All right, what we got 15 minutes, so thank you. Cool. Anybody else? That is one thing that I would would really emphasize too is that you know know your product, know your competition, know. What, what it is that you're trying to do and, and, and look at your look at the people that's doing the same exact thing that you're doing and say, hey, does my stuff compete with what they're doing? Is that's that's really important is for you to do your research. I can't emphasize that enough. Not to mention your product needs to be ready. If you're at the point where you want to hire a publicist, 
you need to have your product ready because if I get media interest and I put you and your product in front of them, um, or if I say, well, it's not quite ready yet, I'm going to lose them and you're going to lose the publicity and I can't go back to them and say, oh, it's done now. Yeah, she's true. Uh, uh, Melissa helped me publish, uh, as a publicist and when I showed her my stuff, my stuff was, uh, Menthu was done, the roach was two issues in, I ended up on, uh, it, was, uh, it was cable access, but it was really good cable access, a great Mantel show. It was, they have a core, off, a core audience, San Diego, LA, and New York. So, and when I got there, the whole half, half, half hour was about me talking about comics and talking about comics in the entertainment industry since I also worked at Warner Brothers. So, be ready. Don't be half ready, be ready. Okay. Uh, my question is, um, I'm a writer, I can't draw. Uh, so what's the, <laughs> what's the best way to, uh, to find something you can draw? So I think I understand that. I'm glad you asked this question. I'm just, I just, I'd, like to, I'd like to find My question is, how do I, how do I find an artist? No, no, so this comes up every time, and I've got a great way to solve this problem. Yeah, give them a book. I've got a great way to solve this problem, and I, I discovered this the last panel we were on. So everybody who's a writer, raise your left hand. Go ahead, everybody who's a writer, raise your left hand. Everybody who's an artist, raise your right hand. The people who have the, you know, talk to each other. Right. Communicate, that's, that's get to know each other. This is the building this to meet the writer, artists yeah. in. So, Jeff's a great example. Like, he met Robert, Robert knew Todd. Now, Rob, Jeff and Todd are Todd creator now. partners, right? There was Todd. Put his hands up. Todd, Todd is here. Now. Um, you know, genre 19. Yeah. I wouldn't genre know any of these people unless I got out and I went to comic book stores and I went to conventions and I went to and don't don't just hang out with your friends. You know, like I like hanging out with Larry, but like I also get, need to get out and hang out with other people I don't know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Fun. Get into dinners. Get into whatever it takes. When you meet somebody who has a similar interest, just socialize. Yeah. It sounds so silly, like so simple, but that's it. Yeah. That's really okay. it. And find somebody. Here's the thing, don't look for somebody who um, is like the greatest artist you've ever seen, because they may not want to work with you. Find somebody that you can like get along with, that, that you can communicate with, because if you can't communicate with that person, you're never going to finish anything. Yeah. I've done it. I've yeah. met great artists, mm -hmm. and I, they're still friends of mine, but I don't communicate with them very well, so we don't create books together. There are two places here at the con that will be incredibly helpful to you. There is the place up here on this floor where there are all the companies doing portfolio review. There are a million and one artists trying to get found over there. And they would love for someone to show interest in their portfolio, even if it's somebody who's not a company. Um, the other thing is Artist Alley downstairs. Yeah, it's right in there. And I mean, you may not walk out of, out of San Diego with, you know, artists in hand, but you will meet a lot of people, and you will learn a lot about what makes artists tick. You should go down there and just talk to them. Yeah, show sure. interest in their work, and, and just talk to them. Get their cards, and also don't be intimidated, because I met a guy today who is an amazing artist, and I asked him what his rates were, and I almost choked. I was like, are you high? You're charging that little? I didn't say that, because I want to hire him. <laughs> you know? But seriously, don't be put off by the amazing quality of the person's art. Talk to them and see what they're like. Uh, also, deviantart.com. Heard of that, man. All right. Um, Pencil Jack. Pencil Jack. Uh, um, oh, digital, digital webbing. Um, and also, Millar World and Bendis's, whatever Bendis's uh, website, both of them have areas where they literally just put writers and artists together. You know, where it's a place for you guys to talk and meet. Search the Miller World? Millar. Millar World. Millar World. M I L L A R. Now, if, well, artists and writers, this is something that Todd and I are kind of nuts about, which is you guys have to respect one another when you get into these projects. Artists often think, oh, I'm the guy who's doing all the heavy lifting. I know how to tell a story better. Uh, they're going to try and take your story from you if they're the wrong kind of person. Writers think, shut up and draw. 
<laughs> and both those things are really wrong. Or shut up and draw what I wrote. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly what I wrote, even if it's not the best, most dramatic, or most interesting way. You really do have to do what Dale said. This is, a, this is your baby. You're kind of making a baby. Don't do it accidentally. Do it like <laughs> romantic, <laughs> right? You know? <laughs> and a baby is always half a All right, person. it's like this. I'll, I'll tell you two things real quick, because I'm only a writer, only quote unquote a writer. First thing is I do a podcast called Writing for Rookies. The second episode is 30 minutes of me just explaining exactly what you need to do from point A to point Z. That's the first thing. The second thing is when you do find that person, Everybody said it, but I'm going to say it very, very clearly. You have to leave space for creative synergy. Because one thing I learned, and I, and I was early in my career, and I, I worked in a dream of comics, and that was very art heavy. So a lot of the people I worked with didn't really respect the literary process of it, right? So one thing I learned from that time period was that if you write your panel style or whatever, and an artist shifts it a little bit to make it more visually interesting, or really to improve the visual narrative, because that's what it, that's what it really is, a visual narrative. Yeah. Don't get so married, guys, I can't, I can't talk. Um, don't get so married to whatever it is you wrote. Be willing to compromise for the creative synergy. That's something, that, and Warren Ellis said it best recently, because more people have been asking Warren Ellis this over and over again, and what he said was that I had to learn to reduce the word bubbles and then describe very incredible visuals. I find that, in, particularly for web comics and this new age, Marvel and DC go overboard with way too many word balloons and caption boxes, but you'll find that manga outsells everything because it is condensed storytelling verbally, yeah. but expanded storytelling Visually. That's great. That's something we need to think about. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, you mean, one, of, one of the best examples of it, 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 it wasn't just these two gentlemen that did it, but the Lee Kirby way of approaching the story. Uh, why does the Silver Surfer exist? Some of you may know, some of you may not. Stan Lee didn't write it into the script. Uh, <laughs> Jack Kirby said, hey, if this dude is big enough to eat a planet to survive, he has to have a heroine. And he was, and it was a surfing time period, and he was, he was like, I'm gonna make him a surfer. <laughs> he became the Silver Surfer, and became damn near big as Galactus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and more, more people know about him, and in the Pantheon, he is as big. But it wasn't because, it was because Lee made space for Kirby, Kirby took that space and did something with it well. And as artists, I'm gonna be on us for a second. As an artist, draw something well. Don't, this is not self-pleasuring. Yeah. <laughs> Look at what I can draw. That's not it. It's about the story. What does the story need? That writer, if you have a question about something that's pivotal in the story that that writer wrote, ask him or her. Do you have a reason why this, this is why I'm looking at this. What do you think? You know. They will give you some feedback which will help your visions. Ask somebody. What Dale said, communicate. Ask somebody. Those are great answers, guys. Thank you. Man. It's worth asking an artist, what do you want to draw? Yeah. It, it, that's, a, that's a really valuable question. Um, because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they need to be well, they, they need to be excited about it. Creati creativity, if you're doing it just for the paycheck, something's lost. You know what I mean? Um, Every artist I've ever worked with, if I get a chance to really get a chance to communicate with them, I say, well, what, what flips your skirt? What do you, what makes you, what makes you want to put pen to paper? You know, and I'm not saying that I'm going to do, you know, I'm going to do exactly what they say, but I want to bring out the things that are going to get them excited. Right. You know, one, one um, thing, one I mean, thing you can do is, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I only have more sense. Yeah. My my scripts when I write a comic script. That comic script was written for that artist. It's yes. written for them to enjoy. Yeah. It is written for the, to, if I can move them into the story, then that they will move the audience into the story. Right. You know what I mean? Right. I mean, it is a personal communication between me and the artist. That's, That's awesome. If, if you can't have, a, this is really stupid, but if you can't have a conversation with your artist, and like a literal words conversation with your artist, you're never, ever going to make a great book. Right. That's, so. I'm sorry, Mary. No, 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 no,
what I was going to say is that you have your story that you're writing. You have, say, X amount of issues that you've already written out. You find an artist that is that you you talk to them. You you've got an understanding of what they want. You take your story and you're not completely changing it, but you're doing things a little bit differently with your script that is going to entice that penciler to really give you his best work. You're not changing your story, you're just kind of rewriting it a little bit that to, to make it, to give it an emphasis of what that artist or what that penciler is going to be doing for your story. So, I was just going to say, um, one thing some none of you have asked about, and we only have a couple minutes because I do want folks up here to announce what it is they're working on right now, what they would like for you to know about their present efforts, uh, a nugget of information that's important, and we did get the, 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 the danger zone sign. But um, Brandon and Jeff have specifically written an animation, as we mentioned, and we've talked about novels, we've talked about the process, we've talked about publicity. I'd like for each of them to at least spend a minute talking about their efforts, Ben 10 stuff, Thundercat stuff, about something about that process, which might also be informative for folks out there. Okay, Brandon. Well, what do you want to know exactly? Have a good bit of I mean, come on, come on, come on. I mean, all I can really say is, well, I wanted to say something to a guy in black that spoke. Um, first thing is that our pop culture is compartmentalized in a way that has never been in human history. Like there's something, like for example, the fact that there's a subgenre called erotic paranormal romance means that, I mean, no, it's, it's good and bad thing because people are being serviced, so to speak. <laughs> Whoa, I know that. Keep, keep digging, keep digging, just keep digging. People, people, are, people are being serviced in a sense, but there's also a message, there's a message board for everything. Right. Nobody said that? One of the ways that I even got to the point I'm at, so to speak, in, in my career is because I spent a lot of time online looking at what, because there's a lot of information exchange and message wars between religious and race wars that you can actually use to what? advance your career. No, most message wars deteriorate into race and great religion wars. Yeah, so yeah. eventually. Politics. Eventually. Yeah. Almost all of them. The hell you say. Yes. Um, as far as animation goes, the one thing I would say is anybody, in, if anybody in here is interested in breaking into animation. It's a lot, it's not easy, but it's much easier to break into animation writing than it is, let's say, working on like Grey's Anatomy or something along those lines. What I would say is that you really need to understand, and I mentioned this before, is the synergy. Because when I got onto Thundercats, it was my first Hollywood credit ever. And one of the things That's I learned is, it is, it is a pretty good credit. And one of the things I learned was that what you write, you cannot, it's not in stone. Yes. And because somebody changes it, or you have somebody come along and say, hey, this isn't quite right, it doesn't mean you're bad. It means that for the, what that show is, remember, animated series, particularly boys' adventure animation, is written to sell toys. Uh -huh. You can't have an episode where somebody's just like looking at a skull and just talking about erasure. Mm -hmm. So you have to think about the fact that you are beholden to commercial interests when you start working with larger corporations. And that's something I think that a lot of indie folks, they just go, oh, I'm not doing it. I'm, you know, I'm like, well, yeah, you could be that way, but you know, ultimately you're not going to get a job because the system is very corporate and very commercial. So I would say that if you get to a certain point and you find work coming towards you from the commercial side, don't always turn it down because I, Thundercats propelled Shadow on my graphic novel into being reviewed in Ain't It Cool News, Forbes, Wired, and USA Today. So without Thundercats, none of that would happen. So think about that. Um, I tried for many years to write uh, for the Justice League cartoon, for various Batman cartoons. Uh, I love superheroes in any form that I can get my teeth into. Uh, I couldn't get arrested. Um, I, my partner and I put out our comic book, and a person I had a sort of a relationship with on the web read that comic book and asked me, would I like to write some Ben Tens? And I was like, uh, uh, yeah, you know. Uh, but I had no ideas because I had no thought whatsoever that I might ever one day get to do it. I had been told by life, you're never going to get to do this, so don't you know, put it off the plate. The point of that is, they talk about luck, 
but I don't really believe in luck. What I believe is in working hard and getting better. And those random things that happen to you over the course of your life, sometimes they happen and you go, oh, God, I wish I could have done better. Well, you did the best you could in that moment. Get better. The next time that wheel turns, you will be ready for that opportunity. I don't believe in the Eminem song, you only get one shot. You get a lot of shots. Be ready for the next one. Uh, but really be ready, because everybody else is competing for that same brass ring. So be, be mean to yourself, but not too mean. Be hard on yourself, but not too hard. And look at your competition with a sober eye, not with a jealous eye. And really say, where do I sit here? Did you just make all that up? Yep, right on top of my head. <laughs> what, what are you working on now, man? Let's, let's I'm run working on. on um, I said I can't talk about the Dark Horse project, except that it's going to be in Dark Horse Presents in January. I could miss it. Um, and um, Dark Horse Presents in January. Dark Horse Presents in January. That's all I can say. Um, What's that? <laughs> yes, no, all the it's world it's Twitter. Twitter. But I would like to say this, and it's, it's sucky because it's, it's something my partner and I put out last year because in, in the theme of this uh, conversation, we had a bumpy ride getting our first book out. Our first book took five tries to get something on the market, including something with Robert that just didn't come together for a lot of different reasons, and that's another thing. It, it really is a marathon. So we decided it might be an interesting idea to put that into book form. And, okay, gotta go. It's called Ash Cans. It's on Amazon. It's cheap. It'll help. Okay. If you're interested in the website, that was for finding comics. Hey, if you uh, just take my name, you know,